When I was a child, about 10 years old or so, I had seen a movie on television that depicted a rape scene. And it was something that I never should have seen at that age. Um, and it just was so deeply disturbing to me. I, I remember just being marked by that experience of, of seeing this, this rape occur. And so I always grew up with this underlying feeling, um, this haunting feeling that rape has to be the worst thing that could ever happen to a person. And um, I'd see a report come out on the news or hear about something on the news, and I just thought, you know, what must a woman go through that experiences something like that? And what kind of man out there would do something like that to a person? And so I had, you know, that experience as a child that really, I'd say, wounded me in a pretty profound way. And so when I first found out about human trafficking and that there were women who were being forced into lifestyles of systematic rape, um, all of those emotions came welling back up. And I was overwhelmed by the thought that this wasn't just a one-time occurrence, but that there were um, numerous, I mean, thousands upon thousands of girls that were being forced into lifestyles of systematic rape. I led a prayer meeting at the International House of Prayer every Monday night at 8 p.m. We pray for two hours and just intercede. And there's about 500 of us, at that time there's about 500 of us that gathered. And before the set on this particular Monday night, I still remember it was February 5th, 2007, we said, we need to pray into this issue. And so we went out that night and, and led the prayer meeting and people's hearts were touched. Most people had never even heard of this. I had just found out about it two days before. So the energy in the room was palpable. And we really felt like during those two hours, we were laboring in intercession for the birthing forth of God's purposes on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, one of the prayers that we prayed was that God would open up doors for authorities to make busts. And it was the very next day that there was um, one of the largest busts in history that occurred. There was 2,400 arrests made in 77 countries. They called it an unprecedented strike um, against child uh, sexual exploitation. And so um, that was a, for us, it was a clear indication of God's zeal over this issue. It's kind of like his exclamation point on us pressing into his heart for this. The burden in our heart started to grow that we need to begin to put feet to our prayers. And so as the fall of that year, a lady approached us at that time and she said, uh, she said, look, I know you don't know me. Um, she said, but God has told me to give you $10,000 to start an organization to fight human trafficking. And so we took that as a sign. And uh, from there, we um, used that as seed money to began a production on a full-length feature documentary to tell the story of modern-day sex slavery. And so we decided to pursue the answers to all the questions that we had, which led us on a four-year journey across four continents uh, following this story and trying to put together all the various moving parts and how they're connected to present people with the uh, most comprehensive picture possible of this issue. It was kind of like following the bread trail. We never had a you know big production budget. We'd take one trip and not have any money left and then plan another one and the day before we leave the money comes. And so it was kind of following that bread trail and just really just walking out the whole project in faith. But um, but God brought us the people who saw the vision, had a heart for it, and had the faith to sow in so into it. So when we finished the production, we had no debt, no investors, um, and all the proceeds now that are generated through the film go directly back into combating uh, human trafficking. 100% of the funds go into that. You know, I made $393 a month, and you could buy a girl for $10 a night. I went to bed with over 500 girls in two years, and because they were there, Ask uh, if you, the favorite type that you like, if you want dark or brown, 
you ask it, and they, the girl come to you. It's like you order a pizza, something like that, you can compare it. The CIA would say that the sale of women, we're not talking pornography, and we're not even talking about prostitution. We're talking about just the sale of women constitutes the third largest industry in the world. Dozens upon dozens upon dozens of girls in a village of 3,000 people that are raped five to 10 times a day for money, for the pleasure of some guy, foreigner coming to our country. If they kill her, if they harm her, they don't care. They do it with a blink of an eye. I can tell you this, that I can't get the pictures of those girls' faces out of my mind still today, and I, I don't imagine that I ever will. When we look at the advertising culture today, it's clear to see that women are being presented as sexual objects. And so this bombardment of images has trained us to view women this way. Well, when, when we see somebody as an object, it's only natural that we begin over time to treat them as an object. So the question of how could trafficking happen in our culture today really isn't the right question. The question is how couldn't it happen in our culture today? I think there's two trends that I see as predominant in the culture as well in the, in the sex industry, and that is the sexualization of children and the sexualization of violence. And when we eroticize the sexualization of violence like is so common in pornography, but also in many mainstream examples, you take the best-selling video game of all time, Grand Theft Auto, and in that video game, you can go buy a prostitute and then you're encouraged to kill her so you can get your money back. And so when we make the sexualization of violence part of our entertainment, but I don't think we really give a lot of thought to what that is doing to our human psyche and the ways that we are being subtly desensitized. And it is sobering when you confront somebody who has completely lost all regard for human dignity and human life. These aren't casual criminals. They're not street thugs. We're talking about some of the most highly influential, highly organized, well-financed um, criminal gangs around the world that this is a major moneymaker for them. They have a very well-structured system and operation in place from the you know, guy that goes out and captures the girls or buys the girls to the taxi cab driver that they're paying off to the person who's, you know, uh, creating documents for their travel documents, forging travel documents to the person who's at the hotel. There's a whole chain of organized crime and corruption involving um, not just the organized crime members themselves, but those that are they're paying bribes to. Um, and all these various places from government officials all the way down to taxi cab drivers. So it's a web of organi organized criminal activity that captures these girls. And there's some parts of the world like Moldova where 400,000 girls have been trafficked from one nation, a nation of a population of 4 million people. How does 10% of the population get trafficked out of a country? And the answer is because of very powerful organized crime groups that, uh, I mean, frankly, the law enforcement officials are more afraid of 
the organized crime than they are of their own government. And so um, when you have that kind of fear element, that kind of power, that kind of organization, uh, you have that kind of financial capacity, it becomes a pretty bleak picture for the girls that they're targeting. When we think about women who have been victimized in human trafficking and then later go on to actually become traffickers, I think it's very difficult for us to understand how that transition takes place because the most of us aren't exposed to the kind of psychological trauma that these girls are exposed to. Basically what happens is our body goes into survival. We, our survival instincts kick in and we learn to cope with this trauma um, to survive. And so they call this Stockholm Syndrome. It's where a victim over time begins to identify with her captor. And so he will brutalize her. He will uh, viciously break her down, mercilessly beat her, and then show her a little bit of mercy and give her something to eat. And when he shows her that little bit of mercy, it begins to forge this bond where she feels like the trafficker is God to her. For her to receive any kindness at all, it's going to come from him. And so though she's been beaten, though she's been brutalized, there's a psychological survival process that kicks in where they actually begin to identify with their captor. And they begin to think thoughts of, oh, he's so merciful towards me, or he's so kind towards me. So now we see that uh, women are becoming traffickers, are becoming harder to detect. And for these women that do become traffickers, they, they look at the girls that they're trafficking and they say, well, I'm not giving it to them as bad as it was done to me. So they actually feel in this very convoluted way, like, like they're kind or, or they're merciful and they're doing these girls a favor and they're helping these girls out. And so it's, it's a very twisted process. It's a hard thing to speak about what occurs behind the veil of human trafficking. I think even human trafficking itself is a convenient euphemism to guard us from the intensity of what's really occurring, which is sex slavery. And so for a girl to reach a point where she looks like the happy hooker on the street corner, there's a whole process that had to occur in her life for her to reach that point. And we encountered victims who were simply abducted, just taken, targeted, taken, and brought to what they call breaking ground houses. And these breaking grounds are specifically set aside for the purpose of breaking girls down into submission to be sold on to work in prostitution. And so the kind of trauma that these girls, that are inflicted on these girls, to break them down is indescribable. It's heartrending to think about uh, what happens to these girls. And once they're broken down and once they've been beaten into submission, um, then, then at that point, they're considered usable goods for the trafficker. And in contrast to what we saw in the transatlantic slave trade where slaves were sold on an auction block and they had chains binding their feet together, um, what happens with these girls is a much more psychological uh, enslavement. And so they don't need chains. They don't need a leash. Um, psychologically, they've been destroyed. And so now they are basically at the mercy of their trafficker. And as I mentioned before, once that Stockholm syndrome begins to take hold of them, they can be out on a street corner. They can, you know, be out at a working a, a public call, for example and with no threat of fleeing, running away, or leaving to the trafficker. Um, she has been convinced that she belongs to him. This is all she's worth. If she does try to leave, he's got the list and names 
of her relatives, her family members, and he's probably done something excruciating in front of her to somebody else to prove to her that he has access to her family members to kill them. Um, he's convinced her that if she goes to the police, that they'll just take her back because she's probably seen that happen before. A lot of these guys are paying bribes to police officers, and a lot of times police officers are the ones paying for these cruel services. So her world begins, quickly becomes very small, and the options don't seem like they exist. You know, when you or I look at life, we think of, I could do this today or I could do that today. Um, when your life has been so confined by an oppressor, um, I think their whole view of life dramatically changes. And so they don't see these uh, choices in life as options. Um, they, they truly are slaves. When a girl's worldview has been shaped almost entirely around abuse and exploitation, it affects her in spirit, soul, and body. And so it's not as though their body is being destroyed, but their other parts of their being aren't being affected. It most definitely affects the way that they view God, if they have a view of God at all. And, and um, it's common, I think, for girls in these conditions to say, why me, God, or um, to form an offense against God that something like this could happen to them. What we have seen interviewing girls around the world is this common encounter that has been described to us from children to grown women, from Southeast Asia to Europe and all across the world. And it's this encounter with what they describe as the man in white. And um, testimony after testimony of individuals in the sex industry who were being brutalized in one way or another, who had a divine intervention, where Jesus came to them as a man in white and, um, and brought about that inward deliverance um, for them. And so many of these girls were liberated spiritually before they were even liberated physically. And um, that's a powerful reality that, you know, God said about, he said, uh, it says in Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 59, it says that, um, my arm is not too short that it cannot save. And I think a lot of times where our arm is too short that it cannot save, that God is reaching into those places. He's hearing the prayers of the saints. He's hearing the groaning of the prisoners. And he's intervening in these situations in powerful supernatural ways to deliver girls out of this spiritually, uh, psychologically, emotionally, physically, in every way. And so the thing that has caused me to fall more deeply in love with God um, these past few years, more than anything else, has been the testimony of these girls whose lives were so absolutely destroyed and where God intervened in their life, where Jesus met them, their lives were completely transformed. And now the fragrance of Christ's love coming through their life and their testimony is so radiant that it just causes me to fall more deeply in love with Jesus that we serve a God who truly goes after the least of these. People talk about rehabilitating the Johns and what do we need to do to rehabilitate the Johns? And I appreciate that notion, but there's a systemic problem that goes even deeper than the need to rehabilitate Johns, and that's the need to rehabilitate our culture, rehabilitate our culture. Because these guys didn't get up yesterday and decide that they're gonna go fly halfway across the world and go buy a child for sex. This is something that has been cultivated through a lifetime that now they're reaching this point where they're willing to cross that threshold and actually buy a person for illicit sex. And when people think about that phenomenon, a John, that a man would rise up and buy another person to have sex with. I think that the notion of that is that there are these, you know, 
few eccentric men on the fringes of society that need to be rehabilitated. But the reality is, is that we're seeing that this is becoming something much, much more ubiquitous in our world. There are some countries that report that up to 70% of men purchase sex in a given country. And so, um, so again, you have to look back at the culture. You have to look back at the hyper-sexualization of our culture, where they say now that, the, um, that over 90% of boys between the ages of eight and 11 years old have viewed pornography. Um, the average age of first exposure to pornography is now um, under 11 years old. And so when a young boy who is not fully emotionally developed begins to feed his mind with the graphic images that are portrayed in pornography, it begins to train him about sexuality, about his sexuality, about his masculinity, about how to treat a woman. And when those images are inherently um, defiling and destructive and demeaning and dehumanizing towards women, of course that's having an effect on him. And so he sees that when he's eight, nine, 10 years old and Pretty soon he's 13 and he's still looking at these images. Pretty soon he's 23, he's still looking at these images. I think over time there's a desensitization and a hardening that happens and even an expectation of what sex should look like. And when that doesn't translate to the real world, I think the option for prostitution becomes a very viable option for them. They can do all these things that they've seen growing up. Growing up, uh, We're living in a different age and I think we're still trying to catch up to the implications of having everything available to us in complete anonymity um, at the touch of our fingertips. And it's the internet, pornography, the sexualization of our culture is having a devastating effect upon this generation of men. And we're seeing a generation of Johns be groomed um, for the sex industry. William Wilberforce once said, if to be feeling alive to the sufferings of my fellow creatures is to be a fanatic, then I am one of the most incurable fanatics ever permitted to be at large. And so what we are, what our goal is with this film is really to raise up incurable fanatics. It's for people to become aware of what's happening, for their heart to be connected to it, and to do something about it. Because all of us have a part to play in this abolition movement. All of us can use our voice, all of us can say a prayer. All of us can use our money to help um, fund the causes that are combating this injustice.